Welcome to the first Zebra Poetry Film Club in 2021. My name is Thomas Zander Giacomo del Bell and this is my colleague Alexander Gomes. We have again selected touching short films based on excellent poems to present to you today. We have the filmmaker Ibele Okoye as a guest, with whom we will talk later uh, about her works and the, her relationship to poetry. So what is the Zebra Poetry Film Club? As you might know, the Zebra Poetry Film Club is a moderated film evening in the monthly program of the House für Poesie that has been taking place regularly since 2014, presented selected poetry films that screened at the Zebra Poetry Film Festival. The aim of the club is to create an understanding of poetry films as a genre in its own, right among a wider audience. Poetry films are films based on poems. Yeah, and today to coincide with the decentralized rewriting the future festival, we present some impressive films in which filmmakers and poets explore their old and new homelands and perhaps even discover new ones. In their films and poems about flight and expulsion, they harm the collective consciousness and provide urgent food for thought. We have selected seven short films based on seven poems for this Zebra Poetry Film Club. In Damascus by Varef Abu Kuba, Stadt in the Mies by Czech and Wessel Hamann, Gone, Syria Gone by Yasra Khalid, At the Border, by Jan Barke and Alfred Marseille, Refugee Blues by Stefan Bocas and Tristan Dors, Die Liebe in den Zeiten der EU by Ebelo Koya, and finally, Meine Heimat by Ebelo Koya. And the poems that these poetry films shown in our program today are based on come from W.H. Auden, Jan Barke, Mahmoud Davish, Yasra Khaled, Björn Kudik, D.J. Oppermann, and Ulrike Almutsandich. We will now see two films, two poetry films. The first one is In Damascus by Varef Abu Kuba. And the second one is Stadt in the Mies, City in the Mist by Czech and Wessel Hamann. Thank you. 
With muscles tensed, I step through the mist, for round me prowls a beast in whitest murkiness. I hear its snarl, and in the veil its shambling columnar paws and canting metal back drift past. At corners of the streets, its bloodshot eyes gleam, and with its bite, steel shuts on steel. This was In Damascus by Warif Abukuba, and he says about his film, more than three years passed since the idea inception up to this moment. This project was my companion during my staying abroad. It was like a friend and an enemy at the same time. Sometimes I spend hours working on it, and sometimes I leave it for months. Warif Abukuba is a Syrian filmmaker. He was born in the city of Altal, which is only 14 kilometers from Damascus. He has a bachelor in graphic art 
from the Faculty of Fine Arts, University of Damascus in 2008. Since then, he worked as a freelancer, filmmaker and motion graphic designer with major companies nationally and internationally. In his poem, the great poet Mahmoud Darwish, who was forced to flee Palestine in 1948 at the age of seven, performs a sweep through the turbulent history of the city of Damascus in Syria, in short, dense, kind of highlight stances. Extremely elusive, Davish fuses the city with the stories that were and are still told about it and in it. Into various linguistic gestures enters again and again during this poem and address C. Is it a lover? Maybe the city itself? And as in passing, even questions about the meaning and form of poetry itself are touched upon. So the whole poem can be read as a historical, a political, an erotical, and a poetological text at the same time, as a search for some sort of multi-layered home. The second film we saw was Stadt in the Mist, The City in the Mist, by Jack and Wessel Harman. It is a metaphorical portrayal of a city trapped in mist as a place of prowling beasts with glowing eyes and bodies of concrete steel and glass, based on the classic Afrikaans poem by DJ Oppermann. Which is a very short urban poem by Oppermann, who lived from 1914 till 1985 and is considered one of the best known Afrikaans poets of the 20th century. The poem could almost be described as a scene from an early horror movie to be crept around and fought by an animal that you never quite get to see. Actually, I'm thinking, for instance, of the simple yet highly effective key sequences in Jacques Tourneur's film Cat People from 1942. But like any good poem, this one too doesn't directly tell us who or what it is about. After just 10 lines, however, we get the feeling that the titular city itself might be the monster stalking the walker and the speaker of the poem in the fog. So the city here appears as a kind of uncanny non-home. We will now see Gone is Syria Gone by Yasra Khalid. Έφυγε η Συρία. Έφυγε. Πήρε τις μαντήλες της, τους δρόμους της, τα χαλάσματά της, ζεύτηκε τους νεκρούς της και έφυγε. Πήρε τη λαλιά της και τις προσωπικές της υποθέσεις, τον εναέριο χώρο της και τις χερσαίες δυνάμεις της. Πήρε τη γεωπολιτική της θέση και έφυγε. Έφυγε η Συρία. Έφυγε. Την είδαν το πρωί να αφήνει το κλειδί κατά από το χαλάκι της εξώπορτας, να λέει μια σύντομη προσευχή, να δένει τα κορδόνια της και να φεύγει. Την είδαν να χαιρετά τον Χατζίκ που έχει το μανάβικο στη γωνία, το κουρνά τα Σαουντά, την νεκρά θάλασσα και να φεύγει. Την είδαν να χαιρετά τις μιλιές στην αυλή της, το σκυλί που κοιμόταν στο δρόμο, τους ανταποκριτές του πρακτορείου Reuters. Έφυγε η Συρία. Έφυγε. Δεν άντεχε άλλους θανάτους στο κορμί της. Δεν χώραγε άλλους θανάτους στο πετσί της. Τους θυμάται έναν έναν τους νεκρούς της κι ας είναι χιλιάδες και χιλιάδες. Κι ας μη θυμάται πρόσθεση και αφαίρεση. 
Θυμάται τον Ναμπίλ που φώναξε λευτεριά στη Συρία και του κόψανε τα δύο του δάχτυλα. Θυμάται τα παιδιά που κρέμασαν στη πλατεία επειδή γράψανε στον τοίχο για τρέι στη σειρά σου. Θυμάται τον Λουκμάν, τον ποιητή, που τον του φέκησαν μαζί με τα βιβλία του και τα βοηθητικά του ρήματα. Τη Φαΐζα, που την πλάκωσε ο τοίχο μαζί με τι δυο τη κόρε. Θυμάται την πολιορκία τη Χόμ και την Πάμα Άμρ. Το γεροζευγολάτι που μιλούσε δυνατά στα μουλάρια του. Τη δασκάλα στη Λατάκια, εκείνη με τα σειρμάτινα γυαλιά που διάβαζε στα παιδιά ποίηματα της Ανίγιας Αλίχ. Την νοσοκόμα που έκλεγε στο νοσοκομείο της Τζις Αλ Σούγουρ. Τη γάτα που χουζούρευε στον ίσκενο στο Γιώτα Χάιλουξ. <Κι> Θυμάται τον Αμπού τον Κουρέα, τις τσατσάρες και τις κολόνιες του, που μια φορά έκοψε κατά λάθο το αυτή ενός συγχωριανού του. Θυμάται τη γιαγιά με Ισάμ, που κάθε Κυριακή μαγείρευε κοτόπουλο με κόλιανδρο για όλη την οικογένεια. Μέχρι που μια μέρα εμφανίστηκαν στρατιώτες στο κατόφλι της. Θυμάται τα παιδιά που έπαιζαν μπάλα στον δρόμο όταν ένα βαρέλι γεμάτο TNT έσκασε δίπλα στον Χαλίλ που ήταν η σειρά του να παίξει τερματοφύλακα. Θυμάται όλα τα ονόματα των βασανισμένων, τα κομμένα γεννητικά όργανα, τις μαύρες τρύπες στις κόγχες των ματιών. Θυμάται όλα τα ονόματα των νεκρών της κι ας είναι χιλιάδες και χιλιάδες κι ας μη θυμάται πρόσθεση και αφαίρεση. Έφυγε η Συρία. Έφυγε. Άφησε πίσω έναν χάρτη της Ευρώπης στα Αραβικά μαζί με μερικές επιστολές του Ιμπν Αλαραμπή. Άφησε πίσω το καπέλο της και τα γυαλιά για διάβασμα τη σημαία με τα στέρια και το εθνόσημό τη. Πήρε μαζί της τον Ορόντι, μ' άφησε πίσω τον Εφράτη. Πήρε μαζί της τη Δαμασκό, μ' άφησε πίσω τις εφτά τις πύλες. Πήρε μαζί της τα βουνά και τις παιδιάδες και έφυγε. Λένε ότι φώναξε τέρμα πια με το θάνατο. Έσχιαξε το φουστάνι της και έφυγε. Ήταν τα χέρια της γεμάτα ανθρώπους. Κάθε δρασκελιά της τέσσερις οριές καθώς λένε. Και οι οκάδες του πόνου της ήταν αβάσταχτες, όπως τις έσερνε μαζί της. Έφυγε η Συρία. Έφυγε. Οι στρατιώτες της Χεσμπολάχ έμειναν χωρίς γη κατά από τα πόδια τους. Και οι Αμερικανοί στρατιώτες έμειναν χωρίς γη κατά από τα πόδια τους. Οι Ιρανοί στρατιώτες, αυτοί κι ανέχασαν τη γη κατά από τα πόδια τους. Έμεινε το Υπουργικό Συμβούλιο χωρίς χώρα να κυβερνήσει. Τα Ρώσικα βομβαρδιστικά, χωρίς ουρανό να πετάξουν. Και έμειναν όλοι να κοιτούν με απορία τη μαύρη τρύπα στον χάρτη. Γιατί έφυγε η Συρία. Έφυγε. Και κανείς δεν ξέρει προς τα που τράβηξε. Hardig 
This was the film Gone is Syria Gone by Yasra Khalid. He describes the film as one day Syria decides to leave, carrying her words, her personal affairs, her airspace and ground forces. She takes off and departs. It was a documentary poetry film that points to the often cruel reality of the refugee situation in Europe. Yasra Khaled, born in the Soviet Union as the son of a Czechian and a Greek, grew up partly in Munich, then again in Athens. He knows the problem of the double homeland, the life between the cultures. He still translates contemporary poetry from German into Greek, among other languages. In his poem, an entire country goes into exile. Syria even takes its geopolitical position with it and disappears. The personification of a country, maltreated by war and no longer able to bear itself, seems highly vivid since the figure Syria interacts with the everyday, the official and the sublime in equal measure. This way, the country remembers all its dead, as the poem itself puts it, and gives a very tangible face to some of them. Thus, Khaled's poem itself becomes some sort of memory space, a preserver of destroyed lives by evoking their stories. The next film we will see is At the Border by Jan Barke and Alfred Marseille. Now refugees fearing war and their country are mostly heading to Europe in search of a better life. But what they're seeing in the future is where every day they're going to be child refugees have been sexually exploited. However, some of the children are not lucky enough to reach Europe. On Saturday, nearly 40 people drowned after the boat sank in the Aegean Sea while trying to reach Greece from Italy. Thank <laughs> you. 
activity this threatening to give the scientific code the punishment they deserve. Elsewhere in the British city of Dover, crashes erupted between the cannon and supporters of refugees. The police were stuck in the middle of the fight with several arrests from both sides. The anti refugee protesters rallied after calls by far right groups, including the Southeast Alliance, the National Front, the Northwest Infidel. But an anti refugee sentiment is growing across Europe. The German Chancellor has defended her open door policy for the asylum seekers. But an um, European Union. The country is incomprehensible to me that a European Union with 500 million inhabitants cannot take in, for example, one million Syrians. Or as a country with 5 million inhabitants like Lebanon is managing it. That does not give a good impression of our country. We speak about our values every day, but we are not prepared to do our part. And Syria is not on the other side of the equator. This was At the Border by Jan Barke and Alfred Marseille, a poetic reflection on the ambiguities of the refugee crisis, media coverage, extremist propaganda, and EU politics. Alfred Marseille is a designer and media artist, background in philosophy and electronic music. He is a designer for interactive media since 1995. With this film, we were moving a bit closer geographically to Germany, just across the border from here into the Netherlands. Another example of a great political poem coming from Jan Barke, born in 1956. Barke is not only a poet and a translator, primarily from the English, he also curated the renowned International Poetry Festival in Rotterdam for many years. Like a pamphlet, his poem begins only to evolve into a confluence of political discourse and poetic imagery. It takes on the perspective of people in a refugee camp without lapsing into oversimplistic pity, which as we know is also just a form of arrogance or trying to lecture anyone. Perhaps this is the only way to create the love that is, according to Barker, always necessary in addition to all understanding in order to comprehend other lives. The next film we will see is Refugee Blues by Stefan Bocas and Tristan Dawes. Say, this city has 10 million souls. Some are living in mansions. Some are living in holes. Yet there's no place for us, my dear. Yet there's no place for us. Once we had a country and we thought it fair. Look in the atlas and you'll find it there. We cannot go there now, my dear. We cannot go there now. In the village churchyard, there grows an old yew. Every spring, it blossoms anew. Old passports can't do that, my dear. Old passports can't do that. 
The council banged the table and said, if you have got no passport, you are officially dead. But we are still alive, my dear, but we are still alive. Went to a committee, they offered me a chair, asked me politely to return next year. But where shall we go today, my dear? But where shall we go today? Came to a public meeting, the speaker got up and said, if we let them in, they will steal our daily bread. He was talking of you and me, my dear. He was talking of you and me. Thought I heard the thunder rumbling in the sky. It was Hitler over Europe saying, they must die. Oh, we were in his mind, my dear. Oh, we were in his mind. Saw a poodle in a jacket fastened with a pin. So a door opened and a cat let in. But they weren't German Jews, my dear. But they weren't German Jews. Went down the harbor and stood upon the quay. Saw the fish swimming as if they were free. Only 10 feet away, my dear. Only 10 feet away. Walked through a wood, saw the birds in the trees. They had no politicians and sang at their ease. They weren't the human race, my dear. They weren't the human race. Dreamed I saw a building with a thousand floors, a thousand windows and a thousand doors. Not one of them was ours, my dear. Not one of them was ours. Stood on a great plain in the falling snow. 10,000 soldiers march to and fro, looking for you and me, my dear, looking for you and me. This was the film Refugee Blues by Stephen Bogas and Christian Dawes. 
set to the verses of W. H. Auden's poem Refugee Blues, charts a day in a jungle, the refugees camp outside Calais. Stephen Bogars is a German-American London-based filmmaker, producer and cinematographer. He has shot and directed award-winning documentaries and short fiction and is currently in post-production for his first feature-length documentary and in pre-production for multiple international fiction, animation and documentary pro projects. Tristan Dors is a London-based documentary filmmaker. His work has often focused on the marginalized in society, particularly in the field of mental health. The film updates the harrowing poem Refugee Blues by W.H. Auden, as Thomas said earlier. He's a 20th century British classic born in York in 1903 and died in Vienna in 1973. The poem dates back to 1939. It's a horribly clear-eyed lament over the gradual exclusion and the murder of Europe's Jews. In the poem, the victims themselves speak with sarcasm and black humor, but also in a clear poetic imagery that is all too relevant again today. The film takes these images appropriately for current, the poem, for example, is read by Noah, a refugee and a former child soldier from Uganda. And the poem gives that and stands it. Schutz wieder eine Linie zieht. Das muss. Es darf geschossen werden. Das muss. Es darf geschossen werden. Gefilmt. Es darf gefilmt werden. Das darf gefilmt werden. Wert von dieser Kontinenten streichen am Ulvers. Wie der die Abwehr aufbaut. Es darf geschossen werden. Das muss. Es darf geschossen werden. Das muss, das muss, das muss, das muss. Das muss. Das muss. Wie erdvoll dieser Kontinent mit Sternchen am Revers. Warte. Mutti macht noch schnell den Abwasch. Als im Süden die ersten Tonschuhe abgespült wurden, spielt das weit weiß, weit weiter gefischt wurden. Das muss. Es darf so gefeuert werden. Das muss. Es darf so gefeuert werden. Es darf so gefeuert werden. Es darf so gefeuert werden.
Ich habe die Namen der großen Vögel vergessen. Jeden Juni fällt Brot vom Fürst einer Scheune, die jetzt leer steht. Später im Jahr stehen sie steif auf den Feldern. Von der Straße her flocken die Kleider weiß aus. Von Weitem riecht nach verscheuerten Streusen Stahl, geborsten im Gut von jenem Gewitter am anderen Tag. Meine Heimat. In der Heimat brechen sich Namen an der Schorle im Wort. Was dort angebaut wird, ist mir fremd. Now welcome our special guest, Abelo Okoye. 
Born in Nigeria and migrated to, to Germany in the year 2000, she has been active as an independent animation director and producer since 2006. She wants awards include the Robert Bosch Promotional Prize for Animation, DEFA Research Prize, Ritter Sport Prize of the SIPA Poetry Film Festival, and the Redefreiheit of Amnesty International. She is a two-time winner of the Africa Movie Academy Award. She is the founder of Shrinkfish Media Lab, Nigeria's first ever animation training, and the Animation Club Africa. She also runs the intersectional gender core and climate awareness label Olu Menka, Carlo de Berlin, and Ifu Lefu. Welcome, Ebele Okoye. Thank you very much. So the first thing is uh, we're talking about the films today, in particularly two films, um, Die Liebe in den Zeiten der EU, uh, made in the year 2014. Um, and the second one is uh, Meine Heimat, made in the year 2012. So how did it start it to, that you made animation? I think it was very early in the year of seven you would like to make animation. Could you tell us a little bit about this? Well, the, my story goes back to when I was seven years old. Those days, because uh, I lived in a, in a small village in the southeast of Nigeria, um, it is our nightly uh, culture to tell tales by moonlight. Uh, children will gather around a bonfire and an adult will tell them stories. Also, my brothers were supplying me with cartoons, Charlie Brown and stuff like that. So for me, at that age, I wanted so desperately to see these things come to life because all the stories I was told, I dived into them. And I would, I said I would love to make them say these things, to really make these animals come to life. But I didn't really know it was called animation, actually. And uh, later, when I was about nine or ten, I saw that my first animation, which was, I saw Tom and Jerry, and I was so fascinated. And by the time I was 12, it's a story that people actually don't like to hear, but it's part of my journey. We have these uh, Jehovah's Witnesses that come to knock on the doors every Sunday. So they always came to us and I always liked to take a wake because it was full mm. of beautiful drawings and the watchtower I didn't like because it was giving kind of instructions to life and mm. I was a rebel, I didn't want any instructions. So I liked Awake. So one of those days when I was about 12 or 13, I can't remember exactly, they came and I got a uh, an Awake and I opened it and there was this page saying how animation is made. So there were drawings of peg bars, you know, the animation table and frame by frame and all that. And when I read it, I just couldn't believe my eyes. I was, uh, I said, okay, this is it. So I am going to make this and I don't care if I don't have all the things they mentioned there, like the lights and all that. So my, my dream became really, really solid then. And it's a kind of a strange year for me because it was also that I was 12. It was also at the same age that I made my first ever commercial dress, you know, a dress I made for somebody and they paid me for it was somebody to go for a wedding because I also started sewing when I was seven too. So um, with the, at the age of 12, I really was, decided that this is what I'm going to do. But unfortunately, those days, Nigeria didn't have any animation schools or any uh, possibilities of learning animation. So I studied fine arts and graphic design later. And uh, trust you, I was looking for ways to leave Nigeria. And I also had uh, a tailoring business with employees, but I still said, no, this is not what I want to do. I worked in advertising agencies, but I was like, no, animation is what I want to do. So uh, also in, in Nigeria, it's it's the so-called Nollywood, the very fast uh, film industry, which uh, they the, the output is enormous. And they made the films in, in one week, for example. So animation less. takes or less, and yes. it takes a year. So this is really 
complete other situation and you are the one of the well, yeah maybe two or three people in Nigeria made animations and uh, but you came to Germany in 2000 and then you studied also different things about um, filmmaking animation and so on could you tell us a, bit, a little bit about this first time yes, in Germany Okay, so I got here in the year 2000 because I was because I was looking for ways to leave Nigeria to study animation. I started learning languages. First of all, let me start there. I said I would like to go to a place where English is not spoken. So I started learning French on my own and then later started learning German. But eventually I decided for German because I met some Germans and they were very direct the way I was brought up. I've met a lot of people from different countries, but only when I met Germans, I saw the way I was brought up in them, like being direct and tell you, I don't want this, or I want this, or this is right, and this is not right, and go just go away, I don't like you, you know? So it was really, it fascinated me that there are people who are the way I was raised. And I was like, okay, so then I would like to go to their country if this is where I'm kind, I would like to learn animation. So I came here 2000, though the first time I came to Germany was 1995. I had an exhibition in Nigeria. And it was successful, so I got a Schengen visa, and I, I I went all through the Schengen countries, and I decided to stay in Germany because I landed in Volkswede, in uh, there's a Kunstler, this Kunstler artist colony where you had uh, Paula Modas on Becker and uh, Maria Rilke. Mm -hmm. I actually spent a night on a bed that was supposed to be where they slept. I don't know <laughs> if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I stayed in Volkswede. And uh, in a little village called uh, Gnarenburg. So when I, I, I said I would like to stay, but I couldn't stay because you have to leave. If you can't start stay with a, you can't study with a visitor's visa. So I had to go back to Nigeria. When I got back, I started applying for schools as I've been doing. So 1997, I got an admission to University of Cologne for African Studies, a master's. So, but I only got a visa to do that in 2000. So I came here in 2000 and started my master's and eventually I had a, an internship at a WDR which came through kind of a so it's my story is just so like so many ways it's, it's, it, there is no straight uh, way to everything I've done so I was teaching English in a school in Cologne and I had a student who said he was in VDR so I said okay can I come to your place to do some internship he said, well, you can ask my boss. Because then I was studying design also in, in mm. Dusseldorf, in Fachhochschule Dusseldorf. So I got there and I saw this thing. Somebody gave me something to do. And I was like, what is this? She said, it's for my application for this film school. And I was like, what film school? Do they also teach animation? She said, well, yes, they do. So I dropped it. I said, okay, get just get done with your stuff i'm done here so i left i went home and i looked up this school and i i called them and they said okay send your application so i prepared that was how i left video without just on the spot i dropped everything i was doing went home and prepared my application for the iefs internationale Fiumschule Köln. and i got accepted i made it also last minute <laughs> Yeah. Last minute, that's one of the points. You did many things last minute. You came to yes, Germany last, last minute a lot. Uh, <laughs> I came to Germany last minute. My visa was going to, my studies was extended for three years. The last extension was supposed to expire on 28th of April 2000, which was a Friday, and Studentenwerk closes by 12.30. So on 27th of April, by 4 p.m., the German embassy pages me, I should come and collect my visa. Who can make it from Nigeria by 4 p.m. to Germany the next day? It was like a miracle. I was paying money into my account, and I saw I when I got the paging, I took all the money back, 300,000 Naira then. I came out of the bank, and I saw a Lufthansa office directly in front of me. I went in there. I said, I need a ticket to Germany, a one-way ticket to Germany. They said 280,000 Naira. I said, I don't care. Just give it to me. So I bought 16D is my seat number. I still have my ticket. <laughs> I still have it because it's very historical for me, you know. Yeah. So that's how I came last minute and I found the animation school last minute. <laughs> 
So you uh, worked in the, I think it was in the year 2007 when you uh, made the, uh, an adaption of the um, poem Anna Blume by Kurt Schwitters. Yeah. And this was a co-production for the Robert Bosch Foundation uh, promotional. Yes. You won the Robert Bosch uh, Promotional Prize for Animation. And this was the year, in the year 2010 then, in the Zebra Poetry Film Festival, how we met us in the in the festival. It was a, but it was not the first time you made uh, uh, animation based on a poem, or was it? No, it wasn't. Uh, well, poem, but uh, lyric. Mm -hmm. The poem, um, I would say in that sense, I've done tiny bits of stuff from poems, uh, which were not like I didn't kind of uh, bring them out. But my first, an my first animation from the work of a German author was uh, in 2006, it's The Lunatic. And um, that was actually my ticket to the Robert Bosch program. Uh, because uh, I sent it to Filmfest Dresden and we got I got accepted and I got accepted in a program called uh, Perspectives for Animated Films and where we had to tour uh, Eastern Europe and some parts of Germany, just animators from all over the world. So The Lunatic was written by Simone Kanta and just mm -hmm. lyric. And uh, I remember then she told me about lyricline.org. I didn't know what it was. So she was a member there because she was my flatmate. Mm -hmm. So that's where it goes back. I came to Germany and I, I had a flatmate who's a German mm -hmm. writer. And to my luck was she was very shy to speak English. So I learned German from, from living with her. Mm -hmm. So I made that uh, uh, Die Verrückte is mm -hmm. the title. Uh, the original title is Die, Die Verrückte because it was spoken in German. That was my first work of a German author. And then before I now, from there, I applied well for the Robert Bosch Foundation Prize together with Bulgaria, and we won it. So it's, Anna Blume was the first poetry, I'd say, but the first uh, written work of a German author was uh, uh, Die Verrückte. Mm -hmm. And you are two-time winner of the African Movie uh, um, Academy Awards. Is this um, in the category animation. So this yeah. for your film. This is a lo not long film, but middle long can say is a, some said short film, but it's uh, twenty eight minutes long. The Legacy yes. of Rubies in 2015, and yeah. this is inspired by Af African folk tale. So. Um, was it the last film you made? You have, no. In the meantime, um, you have also made a lot of other animation, I think. Yes, I've been working. I do say I work on very tiny, short clips, awareness stuff and all that. After Legacy of Rubies 2015, um, there are some family, family situations that influenced my life a lot from 2010 when there started incessant deaths in my family. My mother died, my father died, and my mother-in-law died, and my brother died just as I was finishing Legacy of Rubies mm -hmm. in 2015. So that broke me in a way that I kind of stepped back a little bit because I went into a kind of psychological crisis. I'm mm. not. I'm not sure. ashamed to say that. I'm, so I knew that for two years I was struggling to to exist, but I wasn't. So I wasn't succeeding. So I've done a few things after that, but they are just tiny bits. But the one I'm very most proud of is uh, Marcas de Amor. Uh, is the one. Yeah, it's well. talking about domestic violence. It's just two minutes long. And uh, I try, I, it's a part of a series I was working on concerning domestic violence. And I, I just, it's an abstract thing told by, from, the, from the perspective of a child whose father was beating up her mother. But in that film, it's not the father who's the um, oppressor, but the mother, because she was telling the child lies about the beating. She said that 
The father beats her because he loves her. So this leads the child to plan her marriage, uh, saying that when she gets married, she's going to beat up her husband and break the TV, just like her father does, if that is the sign of love. So this is a thing I, it's a very tiny thing, but for me, I love uh, that I was able to put it out there because it, it's gotten a lot of uh, good resonance. Uh, I heard from somebody from Brazil that is being was being shared through WhatsApp and stuff like that. So that was actually the only thing I made after Legacy of Rubies that I would say makes sense to me. I have other tiny, tiny pieces which I'm not talking about. <laughs> yeah. And one thing is uh, uh, you are called or as the mother of African animation. This is an yeah. <laughs> interesting title. <laughs> Well, because when I made, um, when I started animation, I was the only woman in Africa yeah. who was into animation, at least mm -hmm. heard of. I don't know. Maybe there were others, but nobody knew. Mm -hmm. But, and then in 2009, I started the Animation Club Africa. I was mm -hmm. trying to network with people from, I was looking for animation filmmakers from Africa, but I, there was nobody. I researched all over the place. I was all over every social media then, MySpace, all whatever there was, but I found nobody. So when I joined Facebook, I realized that you could start a group there. So I started the Animation Club Africa, and there I was mentoring people, and then people started joining, and some people from other African countries who had knowledge of animation a little bit somehow, they started joining, and there we were kind of mentoring people, you know, helping them. They do their work in progress and upload it, and we talk about it. And I had a few other people that I was mentoring directly, like one-on-one, -on -one. like uh, we have in sessions through... Uh, talking to on phone here from Germany on phone to Nigeria and we're talking about what they do. So, and then 2013, I start, I gave the first ever animation course in Nigeria, Shrinkfish Media Lab. Shrinkfish is my brother's company. He started that company. It's an animation company. He started it to make me come home, but I ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I start, but I cooperated with him and I did uh, that Shrinkfish Media Lab, SMED Lab for short, in 2013. Mm -hmm. It was the very first animation course ever given in Nigeria. And it was, um, people really were not interested, so to say. I had seven students and uh, um, I would say, how many of them are, about four of them continued in animation. Yeah one woman and one there was a lady in there and one of my students was the main voice in the legacy of rubies mm -hmm. because in the class we realized that he's not an animator he's a businessman and he has an amazing <laughs> voice he he's running so many um successful IT businesses today mm -hmm. but he, he but he says it was the attending that animation course that led him to that. So they have. I have a lot of people saying that they were influenced by what I did. I also have some studios in Nigeria today, one called My Magic Carpet Studio. I was shocked to hear from them that it was after they saw the owner said after he watched Legacy of Rubies, he decided to start making animations and he has a very flourishing studio today. So that's, I think these are the reasons why they call me mother of African animation, which I take gladly. I mean, nobody rejects such a title, right? <laughs> and uh, I think I can see your next project right behind you, the virtual reality yep. classes, right behind you, the virtual reality classes, oh. your next projects in virtual rea uh, reality animating. Um, I think this is the next step. Yeah, into the future. <laughs> yes, I started animating in virtual reality in 2019, in January. And, um, but then somehow I broke, I had broken my shoulder earlier, but then it got worse. But I still work there. It's just that I haven't really done the main things I want to do. I have clips on my Vimeo, on my Instagram that I've done in virtual reality, but I haven't finished a complete story on it, I would say, because virtual reality storytelling is totally different from filmmaking, as you know. 
even though we render out the things as films, telling stories in virtual reality requires a totally different approach because it's inter it could be interactive. It's interactive. So I am still working on stuff that I really want to put into APK data. APK is the data you install. You, you know, when you, for instance, when you finish a movie, you have a MP4 or whatever, a software, Excel, or I don't know what it's called for, I, for Apple products. But APK is that for virtual reality, which you just download as an app on wherever and be able to play the game. So I'm still working on that. And on the side, I am learning to code virtual reality games with Unity because I've been in this uh, coding thing a long time. I was, I, I make websites and in the olden days, I was using ActionScript to make websites for Flash websites. And then when PHP came out, it became heavy. So people moved to PHP and with that, a lot of things changed. So these days, nobody writes codes from the beginning. So you just pick a code and uh, from GitHub and uh, tweak it. Sorry, I'm talking tech now. No, no, but okay. This is my life. My <laughs> life is animation and technology, yeah, yeah, art sure. and technology is my anime, uh, my life. So I can't talk one without the other. You know? sure. So my VR projects are still being made. I'm still working on them. And uh, hopefully also to move into the coding to kind of a code uh, virtual virtual reality games because this is the future, you know, and we have to move with the future. Even as artists, as filmmakers, you just have to keep moving with the technology. So today we saw uh, two films of uh, made by you. Uh, one was Meine Heimat, My Homeland. Mm -hmm. This was is the first film we would like to talk to you about and um yeah uh, what was the background we see a little bit of uh, tempelhof airport you uh, cho choose this yeah very famous old uh, airport of berlin in the middle of berlin how come um First of all, that place, uh, Tempelhoferfeld, is really my favorite place in Berlin. When I saw it for the first time, I freaked out because I love space. I love so. It's crazy. I have, for instance, in virtual reality, I am afraid when I have this phobia of the vast empty space. But in real life, I love void, so to say. Yeah. So I, when I saw that airport for the first time, I, I really loved it so much. And I had this uh, a DJI camera, you know, drone, and I was flying it there having fun. So when, that in, when, when I saw the, the, the call for entries for the poetry film of the Zebra Poetry Film Festival of that year, 2012, right? And I read the, star, the poem by Ulrike Almut Sandik and... I just saw everything playing in that airport because knowing the, the backstory of that airport, that it was used before it became the, um, the old airport and before the Cold War and all that, it was a racing ground for dogs, you know? And I read a story of how families would go there every Sunday to get entertained, you know? So for me, when I read that poem about this high mat, it just instantly struck me as the place being talked about because I saw it as a gathering place for people to celebrate their own culture. And that's why for me, it's high mat in that sense for those people those days. And I figured that this poem of uh, Ulrike Almut Sandik is also from very, very far, far, like a, a time before now because she was saying that uh, what they are planting there is totally strange to her okay i decided to this also made everything fall into place for me because when i saw that part that says uh was der angepflanzt wird ist mir fremd what is being planted there is totally strange for me it was exactly the same period i read that they are planning to turn that yeah. airport into a recreational facility with a uh, 
flying men and you know those kind of uh, high tech uh, recreation so i was thinking okay imagine these structures high tech structures just springing up on that vast ground of the airport so this old woman who definitely lives across the street sitting at the window watching this favorite place of hers which she knew as a dog racing ground and later knew it as a place where they were delivering uh, food supplies during the war and suddenly they built all these uh, strange things uh, that were that you should sprout up there like uh, bird man flying all over the place and she's like okay this is strange to me i don't know this so everything fall, fell into place for me completely that story the poem and the airport, it just fell into place for me. And this is also part of the reason why when they started the petition about turning that airport ground into something, whatever, housing and all that, I was the phone of the first people to sign. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that brings us to the poem of um, uh, Ulrika Almusandik or... Uh, making films based on poetry in general. So, yeah, I mean, you you already described a little bit that the pieces just fell into place. Um, the space uh, that you saw and the poem that you read and and what came up to him. But but how do you work with with poetry, which is a very, well, you, as you know, unique, dense form of literature, when turning it into movies, films. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, for me, uh, when I read, the thing is that when I read poetries, mostly it's always the first impression that comes into my head that I interpret. I don't think about it. Because if I'm planning a film, like a narrative film, I would sit and think about camera angle, like uh, how am I going to present the character? What is it going to be? How is it going to be working? You know, I just think about it. But for poetry, I realized I don't think about it. It just comes to me because if I don't get the images in my head while reading the poetry, I don't look for it. Mm -hmm. So I always go for the first images that fall into my head when I read a poetry. And sometimes it's too straightforward, maybe. Maybe I made some straightforward stuff, but that's the way I see it, you know. And I, don't, I, I just don't want to fight with it because for me, it's not like something... I intend to do it's something that has been given to me to interpret by somebody else. So I don't really, I just try to put out what it says to me because I always say like in my own statement, I say that whatever I'm doing as an artist, even if I'm painting, making a film or creating an attire or whatever, I always remember that the person who sees what I produced they only see what they want to see or what they want to perceive. So that's why when I get a piece of poetry to work with, I just produce what I understood from what the author is telling me, is saying, even if it's not what he's saying, but that's the way I understand it. Did you actually uh, meet Ulrika Amutsandich or Björn Kulik? And is it important at all to meet the, um, the poets and to get to know what they might have wanted to say. I've I've met I've met Ulrike Almut Sandik in 2012. There she was at Zebra Poetry Film Festival at the stage, heavily pregnant, rapping on stage. <laughs> and two days after that, she had her child. Two days after that, being on stage. So that was when I met her in 2012. After when they screened those poems, because it was a festival poem, right? So it was screened and she came. I met her then and we've been very well connected since then. And uh, Bjorn Kulik, I also met. Um, also at Zebra, I suppose. Yeah, but it was just, I think I met him only once. For me, yes, it was important for me to meet the authors. Definitely. I would, I would always like to meet anybody I work with their pieces you know, no matter where they are, that, that's my biggest dream to meet them. But it's not as if I want to meet them to ask them, what do you want to say? No, but I just like to meet them. Then I can ask them about the poem later, you know, after I have interpreted it, you know, and then we can compare notes if they <laughs> meet what they're trying to say. Okay. I mean, you're in, you're living in Germany or also in Germany for 
20 years now, as we heard. So that that's, is it? Yeah, yes. obviously. Oh <laughs> um, that's a long time, oh but God. still I was wondering, um, how does it feel for you to, to make movies based on poems about home, homeland, and uh, in Björn Kulik's case, <clears throat> the fortress Europe that are written by people from a relatively secure, one would think, German perspective? Mm. Well, for me, home, the topic of homeland or Heimat is that I would say on one side, I've been running all my life. On the other side, I have a lot of homelands. So this is what brings it for me, because wherever I run to, I find a home there, you know, I'm on the move. So for me, I have, I found a, I left Nigeria 20 years ago. I've lived more as an adult in Europe than I lived in Africa, right? And uh, the, yet, nevertheless, there are things about my homeland as in Nigeria that I still, I would, I maintain. And then when it comes to working on poems from on works from people from Europe or Fortress Europe, of course, this is where I live. And be, I didn't I came here because I wanted to, not because I found myself here. So this is what makes the difference. I'm not saying that my uh, form of living is better than people who found themselves. No, it's a different thing. I was looking for a different culture. I was looking for a different culture, which was why I also learned languages because I said I would like to go to a place where English is not spoken because I want that opportunity to learn a language because if you understand the language that's when you start understanding the people and their culture and I still wish for instance as I'm sitting here I wish I could be a citizen of let's say Malaysia for just one day, just be there, be a Malaysian, be in their culture, be part of the local life, you know, like think like them, know what is important for them and live it, you know. So this is uh, maybe something in me that is always looking for new things. So for me, Europe and my homeland, Africa, they are kind of uh, unified because these are the identities I, I carry in me, you know, I am integrated in the German society and yet I still have my roots where I come from. So I put these together. It's just, then you come to the point of the kind of poems I've uh, worked with when you talk about the Libyan and Saiten, the EU, this is something I cannot ignore as an African living in Europe. It's something sure. I can't ignore because it's something talking about the migrational politics and what is going on. So for me, even though I came here on my own free will, I still respect that there are people who didn't just decide, okay, let me go there. And then they face all these things at the border, you know? So it was, for instance, that poem, Die Liebe in Inseiten der EU, I think it was one of the most amazing things I am able to interpret as an African who lives in Europe. I don't know if that answers your question. It doesn't. Yeah, I think it does somehow. Yeah, but maybe could so, you tell us because we you you've been um, talking about the Ulrike Sandig poem and how it came became a film. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more how the Kulik EU poem became your interpretation, your movie. You mean my my interpretation of it? How I how it yeah. came about? Did it also like? Yeah, you get the, the inspiration. Let's take that very old word. Yeah, when I read, it's also as a festival poem also, when I read it, I thought, oh, wow, this is extremely violent, you know? And then for me, that violence in there, I started thinking about, I mean, I saw the images. That was when I said, this is violence. When he says uh, shooting is shooting back is necessary, you know? And I, uh, I had those images in my head of people replying back. And then I felt, okay, the content of this poem is really something that is that cannot be ignored in the sense that, yes, a kind of a form of a defense is necessary. But then how is this defense going to be carried out? 
if you carry out de defense in a form of violence also, that you're facing violence and you want to defend yourself and you defend yourself with violence, that's not the form of violence that, that's not the form of defense that works. So the image that was in my head instantly when I read that was an image of people shooting back with a slingshot because as children, we used this to attack our teachers. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> So I chose that interpretation when he says shooting back is necessary. So I picked it as something I could identify with because that was the only thing that came into my head. But then to my surprise, when I eventually met Bjorn Kulik uh, at the festival, I think it was Thomas who asked him how he saw my interpretation. And he said that the slingshot is a symbol for, left, for yeah. leftists. Yeah. I didn't know this. So, but I use this in my own interpretation of how it came to me, how I used to shoot back as a child, you know, to people who harassed me when I was a child. I, I shot back with that. So um, the interpreting the film was something that came naturally because of the words that it contained mixed with the, the, the idea that the, the poem, it was written in 1994, right? And then up till that time it was still valid because of the political situation and it's still valid today mm. yeah. so this is something that is timeless you know and uh, my interpretation of it was my point of seeing it and i'm sure definitely there are other more meaningful interpretations that can be given to it anytime because as long as this kind of politics is going on in europe at the borders this poem is just relevant. Hmm. You know. So um, for me, uh, maybe one question again. Uh, um, the Tempelhof Airport and also hmm. the poem by um, Björn Kulik is in one thing is connected with, uh, with guns, with violence, with war. And you grew up in a war, didn't you? Yes, I was born during the war. When I was born, immediately after I was born, the hospital was bombed. <laughs> so my mom took me, she ran away with me and the umbilical cord was still hanging. She cut it in the forest somewhere. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so I am, my name also, I have a second name, it's called Mwabialunaga. It means a child that was born during the war. Because where I come from, we name people, we name children according to their birth situation. So it's a not complete different situation to some of the Germans when they read uh, the poem by um, Björn Kulik, for example, when you said it's so violent for you, you imagine other, uh, yeah, you see it from a complete different perspective. Yeah, I saw it from a complete different perspective, the violence there, because it connected in two things, the violence I've experienced myself and what I have, uh, what I know about the mm. European Union politics, you know, so these two things came um, built together. But of course, I wouldn't be saying to people uh, who are like people at the border, the migrants, I wouldn't say, yeah, shoot back or something like that. Mm. So for me, the shooting back was my own form of shooting back, which I knew as a child. That was what mm. I brought into mm. it. Can or, or must art, your art itself be or become something like a homeland in itself? No, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to because um, it's a kind of a tricky thing because for instance, I used to write poems a lot in English and I paint and when I paint, I write on my paintings. Like when I'm working on painting, anything, any, the poems that will be running into my head that time, I will be writing them. It's part of a painting, you know? But uh, when I came to Germany in 2000, I needed to learn the language. And <clears throat> I had to learn German. I had to make sure I would be able to communicate in German. So because of that, I dropped writing because I wrote in English and my German wasn't in good enough for me to write in German. So over the time, by the time my German got good enough, I would say, to write in, I had already started, I was, I was busy in the area of animation, so to say, I had all that things going for me because so I so that way I dropped writing in that sense completely aside writing for animation yet I would say that for me 
writing is part of who I am. Writing is for me part of being home. Maybe, I don't know, maybe this is why I kind of tend to work more with poetry in animation. Instead of just making cartoons like uh, Simpsons or whatever, you know, I kind of uh, feel drawn to poetry that whenever I read a poetry, I see me, I see images, I want to put it out. So maybe, I don't know, now I'm thinking about it. So maybe this is the, the being, it being like a high mat for me because writing is part of me and I lost it somehow. And maybe I'm still looking for it to find my homeland there in writing, in poems. Thing. That's why it could be. Yeah. Thank you, Abel Koyo, to be our guest. It was really a pleasure to have him. You here in the Zebra Poetry Film Club, and we are really interested in the, and uh, curious about your next projects in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.